So we're talking about the different things that are changing in video conferencing software now that it's everywhere. Now that even, you know, kind of my parents are video conferencing other people to do yoga and things like that. So it's suddenly become a key part of nearly everybody's life. Um, but the different companies are innovating in different ways, doing something slightly different. We've all been in one of those calls where someone's got the space background on or something yeah. like that, you know. <laughs> so you get these virtual backgrounds, yes, and they somehow cleverly, with video uh, analysis, cut out your, your body and change the background. And we're not going into that today, but instead we're looking at what that does for meetings and how people feel with different settings and whether any of them help people work and collaborate and is it good enough to replace actual meetings. There's decades of research actually where people have been trying to figure out how to help remote teams to collaborate and there's a few aspects to this. There's uh, computer mediated communication as a whole area like how do you improve communication when there's technology in between you and the other person and then there is team collaboration tools to help you, you know, manage your source code or you know, book meetings or somehow draw diagrams to each other even though you're miles away. And then there's ways of um, creating uh, virtual environments that you can join and you can all go into that somehow make it feel like you're in another place. And all three of these things are competing with each other for what might be a good solution for remote teams. And a lot of the time you're asking yourself, which ones do I need? Do I need to be in a virtual world in order to talk to someone? Do I need collaboration tools for a meeting? And so it's a mixture of these different aspects for what you want to have. A few years ago on Computify, we did something about a telepresence thing where, you know, yes. you, you 3D scan someone and then they appear somewhere else and you can chat to them like you're in Star Wars or something like that. Is that what we're going for here? Well, they're really interesting because they often match a little bit of the research theory as to what's going to happen. And then the research sort of copies a bit what the science fiction films do. But you've seen it probably in Star Wars where there's six of them sat around in a kind of circle and one of the people in the circle is a hologram and they're joining in just like they're in the room and you kind of feel like that would be the ideal situation but what those often hide is the like the reality of what that one person is seeing at their end because they probably don't have five empty chairs with five holograms in it they they would have a computer screen with maybe like little people in it and they in the films, they magically look to the side when they want to talk to Yoda, who's sat there. But, you know, in practice, they would be like scrolling on their screen to the next person or something. And you wouldn't get the actual, like it's simulated very nicely in film, but not yet happening in the real world. Yeah, so Microsoft Teams have added this new feature called Together Mode. And we spent about 45 minutes together with about, what was there, 10 of us the other day doing a quick example. And it's purposefully changing the way that you see everybody on, in this case, Microsoft Teams. Uh, but it could be on Zoom if they had the same sort of thing implemented. And what it does is it puts everybody in the meeting into one room, a bit like you're in a meeting room, and you included in that are all sort of spaced out in this space. When you first talked to me about this idea, I said, this looks, sounds like an absolute ridiculous gimmick, so let's have a look at it. And I have to be completely honest, my experience was at the time, oh, this is a bit of fun, but the reveal was when we clicked back to gallery mode. And then you suddenly see all of these off-putting backgrounds behind people. Someone's in a kitchen, someone's in a bedroom, someone's in an office. There's a book behind someone, someone's got a bike over there. Suddenly, there's a lot more information that, that's off-putting. That's how I felt. It's certainly true. Like, there's, we have a regular meeting on Wednesdays, and every time, that seems to be the time our friend has their window cleaner come past. And so all the meetings have got one window cleaner in the background. And it's... Um, that's one thing it does is it just removes all the backgrounds, a bit like the virtual backgrounds, but at the same time it then takes all the foregrounds and puts them into one place. And you're right, you do lose lots of varied backgrounds and it takes a lot of your visual processing away from what you have to do. The, the, the other thing that was interesting was for me, and I think this is something they could fix if they put a bit of time and effort in, was the scaling. So, uh, you know, depending on what bit of equipment you're using, where it is and, you know, basically you get different views on people and different sized people and different, yeah. That's actually part of a much bigger issue. But you're right, when we're in the teams, if someone's leaning forward like this and their camera is here, then you've, they've got this massive head and then someone's leaning back over here, kind of relaxed and they're a little teeny person. But you're all on the same size chair in this view and it's a bit weird to see it. Um, but camera angle and position of the camera in relation to the screen, is one of the things that makes um, online meetings quite difficult, like video conference meetings, because uh, ideally, if you're in a physical space like this one we're in, uh, there'd be one person in each chair, or at the moment, you know, one person every two meters away on these chairs. And when someone down there talks, you all look at them. 
And that would work in theory, but if my camera's here and my screen's here, then I spend the whole meeting talking here, and then when I look at the camera, I'm like this. And so you're all over here, and I'm, it's the separation of camera and screen is a thing that creates part of the problem. And what it means is that you don't know what people are looking at. You don't know if they're looking at you. And if everyone wants to talk to Jane over there, then not everyone's, some people have gone, oh, and some people have looked up to this bit because they've got teams on this part of their computer screen. And it's, uh, I have two screens at home and you know, I have teams over here and then my work over here. So when I'm looking at the people, I'm like this. And it's the separation of where you're looking and what you're, who you're talking to is a big aspect of what makes it hard for people to know what to do. And this is part of non-verbal body language. If you have a whole upper body, rather than just a head or just head and shoulders, then you immediately increases a rate of co-understanding as to what's happening. So there's been experiments where they say, you know, this is what we've discussed in the last meeting. Which of these things do you think was true? And they take simple ratings like that or simple questionnaires, and you realize that people get a better understanding from a meeting very quickly. If you can see all of the body language and everything, like, are they disappointed by something that's just been said or you know, who are they turning to? I mean, an obvious one is folding the arms, right? Yes, yes, I'm not at all happy with that. <laughs> one thing this together mode is supposed to do is have spatial consistency. So uh, one thing in, if you're not on together mode is that on your screen you might have, I might have Steve here and Dave there and me down here, I was a little bit in the corner, and then on Steve's computer it's the opposite way around. Um, but in together mode everyone gets a seat in the room and they're in that seat for everybody who's looking at together mode. And so you can do things like when someone talks, everyone does look a little bit to the same chair. Um, and so you get spatial consistency kind of built in. So that was one thing they were going for. How do you get it so you get spatial consistency in a video conferencing meeting? And one solution was to put you and everybody in one space, have a fixed position that replicates on all the screens. And that builds at least some element of spatial consistency that's not been there before. There are loads of challenges with this. But does it make that much difference to people if you make a minor adjustment? So one of the aspects is it's called the cone of gaze and it's to decide whether someone's looking at you. And that is part of, as I mentioned earlier, the kind of um, whether you trust what someone said or whether you understand effectively what they said or whether, they, whether you think someone's talking even to you when they've said something should happen. So sometimes in a meeting you will say, is that something you can do uh, for the next meeting? And there's, you don't explicitly say, you know, I want, to, I want Sean to do this for the next meeting. Um, so you have to start adding that in your speech to make sure everyone understands it. So it adds overload or overhead to your speech. Um, but if you can make it so that things like uh, gaze is seemingly directed at the right person, then having the spatial consistency in teams means that if you did look over there uh, to the person in the top, who's in the top left seat and everyone sort of looked towards them, and you can even point towards them a little bit, which we did in the meeting, that creates some of the reliability or understanding. But what you have to try and get is the sense that they actually the eyes are looking at you. And as you said, it really, you can really tell if someone's looking at the camera or you just a little bit. So there's a specific angle of, called the cone of gaze, where if you're within a certain five degree angle, then it looks like someone is looking plausibly at you. Uh, then that will be what you want to try and recreate. So there's other versions of research where they've tried to replace your eyes with a little bit of, a, of an angle, so it looks like your eyes are actually just a little bit to the left, so you're looking at someone, but then that starts to look a bit freaky in all the best examples we've seen. I'm imagining one of those paintings in kind of the horror movie where <laughs> yeah. there's a cut out bit where the eyes are, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You can see where people are going. They're trying to make it so that it looks like in real life that you've all looked at someone, and if you've got spatial consistency, that's one step towards making it look like you've all looked to the same place in the screen if you're looking at them. We had some fairly good results with that. I mean. Presumably that's just geometry in a way. It's like doing some clever stuff with where your webcam is, where your seat is in the space. Webcam close to where you're looking on the screen. Presumably you haven't got it full screen on your big 27 inch or on your big 14 inch TV at home. Um, then having the webcam near to where you're going to look anyway. It's, I mean, I, have, I struggle with this with lectures. When I've got lecture notes that I'm reading out to the students and I'm looking to see what, lecture, what slide is showing and that's off away from my webcam. And if there's notes about what needs to be said in a lecture, then you're looking to the side for where those are. So I find myself trying to look at the camera and then see what's next and then look at the camera to deliver the information and then go, so next point. <laughs> so it's, yeah, a big challenge to feel like you're looking at someone and that's what most of the software is trying to recreate to make video conferencing a little bit easier. So one of the other approaches that uh, a company took was Mozilla and they had Mozilla hubs 
And the idea there was that they were borrowing from these open world things like World of Warcraft or Second Life, where you create a 3D virtual environment that you can go into using whichever technology you want to. But the idea is everyone is made even and spatially consistent by going into a virtual world where you have a character that you can style to look like yourself. Um, and then you can do things like have uh, posters or presentations that you go to, a bit like at a conference. So you would walk around inside a kind of 3D VR environment. I was going to say, so this is needing kind of headsets and all that sort of stuff? Not necessarily. I, I can't remember now whether you can access Mozilla Hubs via a VR kit, but you could still do it through your computer screen. But as you're moving around on, in the computer, you see basically other people over there and you move in the space using the controls. And so when they see you coming to the place. Is that open for anyone to try or was that something they were doing internally? Open for general use, I think, if it's still there. Um, but it's, yeah, you could just host meetings on Mozilla Hubs. You get a special ID, like a, a URL to log into, and uh, you just join meetings that way. So various bits of the university were having their weekly meetings in those spaces so they could sort of sit together in a space and watch a presentation on the screen. Is that you over there? I don't know. I, I'm just stood by the river. Hello. Oh, yeah, that's me. I'm the soldier. All right. <laughs> there you are. So this is, yeah, we're in a, I don't know, space. What happens if I turn the camera on? Do you see like my head above it? Oh yeah, I'm seeing something there. I'm seeing a green thing. It looks yellow to me. Oh, okay, it might just be. It's yellowy green. It's, yeah, it's probably yeah. yellow. It's fair. I don't know what that yellow thing is though. That's that's perhaps a share screen type thing, is it? We've left it there. <laughs> yeah, they've just put it over there, and we can move around. So you can see this is the exciting. Alternative having being in a 3D world. Yeah, that's you, that grey robot thing, right? Yeah, it becomes interesting exploring another world like it's a computer game in a way. Um, but it's supposed to democratise the idea that you're all in a space, you're on a shared space, you can move around it, and it's not a kind of weird being in a behind a computer screen experience, but you're somehow together in an event or you know. Well, I reckon, you know, I could be sat in my car on a break between driving somewhere and join a meeting there, and you wouldn't know if I was in an office, in a car, or whatever, right? So it's, I suppose it's assuming you've got a connection, and then that's what everything comes down to, right? The thing this sort of thing loses, though, is the body language. You lose that straight away, so that's one of the things that's been shown to encourage trust, is that you, or understanding, is that you can see the body language and what expression their face is making. Uh, you want to know whether someone doesn't agree with what, what you're saying or thinks you've said something stupid. Um. <laughs> well, nobody can see now is me shaking my head. Yeah. <laughs> number of bytes to come in before we can send the packet out. That's going to introduce some latency. So we need to make sure we choose a packet size that is small enough to not introduce too much latency. So let's say we just had one the byte. The town, the man goes. Sounded to me 20 years ago when I first stumbled on this very much.